welcome uh, all our guests to this uh, virtual webinar of the Neurodevelopmental Discovery Interprofessional Collaborative at the Mailman Center for Child Development at the University of Miami. And the uh, Discovery IPC, that's the Interprofessional Collaborative, is um, organized around bridging the gap between basic and applied science. Uh, and one of the um, uh, preeminent uh, uh, exponents of that uh, perspective is Lucina Uden, who um, bridges um, a computational approach to uh, neuroscience with uh, exciting research in autism spectrum disorder. Um, Lucina received her PhD in cognitive neuroscience from psychology at UCLA and um, then completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Child Study Center at NYU. And she returned to uh, California, this time at the um, uh, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Um, we were lucky enough to hire her into the uh, psychology department at the University of Miami. Um, that was 2014, it seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, since then, Lucina has become the um, head of the Division of Behavioral Neuroscience in the Department of Psychology. Uh, within a cognitive neuroscience framework, uh, Dr. Uden's research examines the organization of large-scale brain networks that support executive functions and other functions, as we'll hear. Um, her current projects focus on understanding dynamic network interactions, underlying cognitive flexibility in neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism. Uh, and she'll be moving us towards uh, more complex and hence more adequate models of um, neurodevelopment in autism. Uh, she's published over 100 scholarly articles on these topics and is a PI of an R01 um, looking specifically at uh, neurodevelopment in autism um, and various uh, almost innumerable uh, related awards. Uh, and with that, won't you join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Uden? Thanks. However, one does that on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Daniel. And if you could do me a favor and just pipe up if the sound is uh, not good or if you can't hear me at any point. I'll take that as Sounds a, is great. Okay, sound is okay? Okay, wonderful, thank you. So um, thanks, Daniel, for that uh, introduction. Thanks to the Millman Center for this invitation. Um, let's see how we manage with my, I think it's my second or third virtual talk, so I'm starting to get the hang of it, as I'm sure all of you are as well. Um, so our lab is focused on answering some broad questions that uh, center around the themes of brain network development and how that underlies cognitive development. So what are sort of the processes by which the connectivity within and between large scale functional systems of the brain uh, kind of develop in ways that enable increasingly sophisticated cognitive processes from childhood through adolescence and into adulthood. And what are the consequences of atypical developmental processes um, in terms of, uh, of uh, contributing to neuro common neurodevelopmental disorders? So um, at any given time, I think our lab spends about one third or two thirds of its energy towards understanding uh, brain network development in clinical populations. But we do this within uh, the context of studies of, of typical adults typically developing children, um, basically in order to understand sort of what, what the departures from these typical processes look like. So we use a multimodal neuroimaging approach, um, including functional magnetic resonance imaging, structural MRI, diffusion-weighted imaging, and connectivity modeling. Uh, and I think a lot of times we spend a bulk of the efforts just trying to validate and understand what these methods tell us in the typical adult brain and use that same approach to understand typical development um, before and maybe even simultaneously with studying clinical populations such as autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. So today I'll really focus on the clinical populations arm of the work, um, but really happy to talk about other projects as, as people uh, have questions towards the end. <clears throat> 
Um, and some of the foundations for this work comes from this newly emergent area that has been called network neuroscience. And even before neuroimaging was a thing, in the early 90s, um, Marcel Meslam had some really great ideas about uh, just from looking at lesions of, uh, of brain lesions in patients, um, a traditional neuropsych approach. Um, but he came to understand that cognition is subserved by interconnected neural networks. And you can think of complex behaviors being mapped at the level of multifocal neural systems. So re really the sort of old idea that one brain region is involved in one function um, sort of gave way to these network approaches in the last 30 years or so. And there's been a lot of computational work that has, um, you know, supported this, this view of brain function. A lot of uh, work comes from Randy McIntosh's lab. And he has this nice idea that he refers to as the neural context. And that's the idea that the functional relevance of a brain area depends on the status of other connected areas in the brain. So if you took a a network with four nodes in it, for example, here in A, these gray nodes might have a different function depending on the status of its interconnected nodes here in black, as you see a different sort of network structure might uh, emerge when these other regions here are coactivated in the second panel. So this neural context idea has um, inspired a lot of the work that you'll hear about today. And finally, we've become very much um, concerned and interested in understanding brain dynamics, so the temporal domain uh, when it comes to understanding brain function um, in both typical and atypical development. So there's um, some work from Louis Pessoa and others suggesting that networks need to be understood in terms of interactions between multiple brain regions as they unfold temporally. And that's something that um, has only recently come into uh, the spotlight again in and fMRI, even though those who study the brain using EEG and MEG and, and other approaches, I've known for a long time that temporal dimension is important for understanding brain function. So uh, when we study brain dynamics, there's a couple of tools that have really um, moved the field forward uh, in cognitive neuroscience in the last 20 years. And one of them is resting state fMRI, in which a participant is just um, lying in the scanner, but as you can see, the brain is never silent and the brain is never um, idle. So even in the resting state, we see spontaneous coherent fluctuations across a number of large-scale brain networks, those that we might find involved in language, memory, attention, and other cognitive processes show uh, very low frequency correlations even in the resting state when those networks are not engaged. So of course, um, many labs have begun to use this uh, intrinsic connectivity approach to map the integrity of large-scale brain networks in, um, in typical and atypically uh, developing populations. And we uh, got this video from Daniel Margulies, and I love to use it because it's just, it's very pretty, but it shows how, uh, you know, even when we're not doing anything at all, the brain is, is doing something. So in terms of autism, we have uh, begun to work in this area, I guess, sometime 2006 or so. And around that time, there was a, the prominent theory that, uh, that connectivity is altered in autism and it is specifically a, a case of underconnectivity. So brain regions, especially in frontal and, and parietal lobes, were thought to be um, underconnected or hypoconnected in individuals with the disorder. Um, and that uh, paper from Marcel Justin colleagues, I think, came out in 2004. But as any the cases with any complex neurodevelopmental condition, the, the picture became more um, complex and, and obscured as neuroimaging continued and the field began to realize that there's not sort of a straightforward underconnectivity story, um, at least uh, as, as more and more studies came out. Several reviews have been written about this topic now, um, trying to understand really what are the brain bases of autism in terms of the connectivity abnormalities, and is it really an over or under connectivity story or something much more complex? Um, why are there so many discrepancies in this neuroimaging literature? Well, uh, when I first kind of jumped into this fray, uh, I noticed a, a couple things. One is, just a sort of mundane but important point that people use different types of methodological approaches and choices um, when they're approaching their uh, uh, MRI data analysis. And there's different pre-processing techniques and data-driven versus hypothesis-driven studies can lead to different and sometimes apparently um, uh, conflicting results. And at the same time, there's anatomy, which um, really drives a lot of our thinking because you know not every brain region is the same. Um, and when you look at whole brain connectivity analyses versus regions of interest, you often find 
um, very marked differences in those two approaches. And finally, um, developmental stage, as a person enmeshed in developmental cognitive neuroscience, I was shocked to find in the beginning that most of the studies of autism and the theories of brain connectivity and autism were just based on adults with the disorder um, and hadn't yet really thought about the uh, developmental unfolding of brain and cognitive processes that might suggest that you may find differences in autism that are specific to children and maybe a different set of differences that are specific to adolescents and yet another when you get to the adult stage. So that was uh, where we, um, that was a jumping off point for my lab in, in 2014. In my postdoctoral work, I did a lot of these sort of whole brain connectivity studies and we found, contrary to the popular belief at the time, we found a lot of evidence for over-connectivity of large scale brain networks in children. This is between the ages of seven and 12, um, high functioning children with autism. Uh, you put them in the scanner, resting state fMRI. You can do all kinds of approaches here. This one independent component analysis study and another using whole brain region of interest, finding primarily evidence for stronger functional connectivity between brain regions in kids with autism compared to typically developing kids. And this was you know, in direct contrast to the under-connectivity story that was published earlier. In fact, it took us many years to publish these findings because no one expected it at the time. Um, but if you look again at specific regions of interest rather than at the whole brain, here a colleague of mine, Dan Abrams at Stanford, uh, wanted to look specifically at voice-selective cortex, parts of the brain that respond when you hear people's voices. And he found that if you look at the posterior superior temporal sulcus in kids with autism, there's actually evidence for underconnectivity of this voice selective cortex. And in fact, it uh, shows less connectivity with regions of the brain involved in reward processing, such as the nucleus accumbens. So there is evidence for selective uh, underconnectivity in some specific circuits that we think are involved with uh, autism symptomatology. Then again, if you do this sort of careful anatomical studies of specific brain regions where there's heterogeneity um, within a small patch of cortex, for example, the precuneus along the midline, uh, there's separate regions within the posterior medial cortex that even though they're adjacent to each other in terms of the anatomical uh, real estate, they have vastly different patterns of whole brain functional connectivity. And it turns out that depending on which part of the posterior medial cortex you look at, you can find evidence for either under or over connectivity of some of these areas, which um, sometimes go by the name of the default mode network or default mode network nodes. So in, in some regions, there's actually evidence for um, greater connectivity in kids with autism. And in other regions like the posterior uh, cingulate cortex, or posterior cingulate cortex shows greater connectivity, but the other regions uh, showed under connectivity in autism. So there's, um, so there's mixed patterns depending on which precise anatomical region of interest you look at. So back then I started to think about why these descriptive findings were showing up in the literature in our work and others. And a quick pass of the literature at the time in 2013 suggested to me that those studies that had been conducted in younger children, you know, um, really infants all the way up to about 10 years of age, tended to show hyperconnectivity of brain networks over connectivity patterns, whereas those that were conducted in older um, adolescents and adults show, tended to show this typo connectivity pattern. And as you know, there are no studies where we followed children longitudinally through adolescence into adulthood to really get at this question of what is the developmental signature of brain connectivity in autism. But if you look at the cross-sectional literature, you, there are some hints that the childhood years are characterized by some overconnectivity in autism, where, whereas the adulthood years get more towards the sort of underconnectivity story. I see, let me get back to the slide. So we've been sort of testing this um, idea for a while now. Um, so we've been trying to test this idea about the sort of developmental stage specific um, hypotheses in autism. And that's what we started doing at the University of Miami in 2014. And we were lucky that at, at that time, um, a database known as the Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange was uh, sort of first uh, revealed to the autism neuroimaging community. And this was started by Adriana DiMartino at New York University. And she and others and my group at Stanford and others all over the world um, 
uploaded their data to this database around that time. Um, so there's many, many data sets of neuroimaging that are now available to the public and have been available and have been a great boon for scientists in this field. So Jason Nomi in the lab has done almost a great chunk of the work I'll show you today, took advantage of this public data set and um, especially the NYU data set had a nice sample that included children between eight and 11, as well as adolescents between 11 and 18, and then adults age 18 and above. So we could really start to ask the question about um, developmental stage specific brain connectivity abnormalities in autism. And long story short here, he found differences in within and between network connectivity in children with the disorder compared to typically developing children. In adolescents, there were some differences, but they were not as strong. And when it came to adults, we actually didn't find brain differences in adults with autism versus um, uh, neurotypical adults. So suggesting that whatever changes we see in the brain do seem more um, emphasized early in life and, uh, and we don't see as many, quite as many whole brain changes as you get into adulthood in autism. This could be for many reasons that we can speculate about. Um, so taking sort of the same data set, Dina Dejani, a grad student in the lab, asked this question about local connectivity. So not just large scale brain networks, but in a neighborhood of a particular voxel in the brain, uh, how closely is that in terms of its signal to its other neighbors, other 27 neighbors in this case? And I can you know, refer you to the papers here, but the, the idea was to stratify the groups into children, adolescents, and adults again, to see that the patterns of local connectivity varied depending on uh, which cohort you looked at. And again, children showed the greatest differences in local connectivity, uh, children with autism from typically developing children. But when you get over to adolescents and adults, those brain differences tend to ameliorate. So they almost normalize, if you will, by the adulthood stage. Uh, Casey Burroughs, another grad student in the lab, looked specifically at regions that have been implicated in the social cognitive neuroscience literature and self-related processing and processing of um, of others and found that for these kind of specific nodes, there was also this pattern of, uh, of, um, of actually uh, greater connectivity and typical development in children with the disorder. And again, this sort of brain difference did not show up in adolescents or adults that were studied. And we again did the same kind of analysis looking at childhood and adulthood across uh, dorsal and ventral attention networks of the brain. Chris Ferrant in the lab did this study. Uh, this is actually one of the first studies we did when I got to UM, um, where he again found this uh, patterns consistent with overconnectivity of brain networks in adulthood and underconnectivity of brain networks in autism. Sorry, overconnectivity in childhood and underconnectivity in adulthood um, in individuals with autism. And uh, finally, we had Paolo Odriozola, who was working in our lab a few years later um, and is now a grad student at Yale and she was particularly interested in this amygdala prefrontal circuit which we know to be very important for emotion regulation. So she found something very interesting and different about this particular um, connectivity pathway and that is that um, in specific subregions sub of the medial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala there, were, there was a pattern of underconnectivity in, in autism and this pattern um, held for different age groups, but you could see that it, it uh, changed across the age span of um, you know, around seven years of age to about 25 years of age. So it wasn't just sort of a, a linear um, age-related connectivity pattern. So um, I think I'm gonna do questions at the end because it's impossible to monitor the chat while doing this at the same time. So, um, so basically, what I, we found from all of these studies is that functional connectivity differences observed in childhood uh, autism spectrum disorder can sometimes be absent or reversed in adulthood. Developmental effects may be more pronounced within specific neural circuits, and those developmental effects may vary for uh, specific neural circuits. It's not consistent across the whole brain necessarily. And there's no clear story about over or under connectivity in autism. There's many ways of stratifying samples and um, thinking about the issue, um, but there's not sort of one story that tells us that we can, uh, you know, that we can say like, this is what the brain looks like in autism. There's all these factors that I've mentioned and others that, um, that change the story. So 
this is what gets us to the sort of modern day research domain criteria, which um, National Institute of Health has, has put forth. This is the idea that sometimes the symptom-based categories that we see in the DSM, for example, um, contain very heterogeneous groups of individuals because they're based on um, symptoms only and behaviors only. And the idea is that if you can stratify patients based on uh, biological factors as well, including genetic risks, brain activity, physiology, um, and all kinds of other life and behavioral factors, then we might end up getting subgroups or data-driven categories where all the individuals in these categories might not have the same diagnostic label, but they're grouped more according to some biological factors. And this might help us to um, get to the eventual goal of uh, precision medicine for a variety of, of um, conditions. So of course, many people have been trying to do studies to um, fall into this um, new trend. And it's been interesting and enlightening and probably also frustrating for many folks who are trying to um, now do these much larger sample studies to try to stratify heterogeneity in, in complex neurodevelopmental disorders. It's not, it's not been easy, I would say. Um, and a lot of times people ask me to write uh, commentaries on papers that are out there. And all the commentaries that I've done in the last couple of years have been something to do with, or many of them have had to do with parsing heterogeneity in autism. What are the sources of heterogeneity and why, why is the brain imaging literature so mixed? Um, partly because of this heterogeneity. So there's um, you know, lots of considerations uh, uh, in terms of idiosyncrasy and variability of responses in autism. Um, brain state, now that refers to sleep, wake, and, and states of consciousness and how that affects functional connectivity, as well as the participant functioning level, meaning um, the IQ level uh, of the individuals who are being investigated, of course, um, can also affect the, find, the brain connectivity findings. So these are all sort of some of the ways we can parse heterogeneity in autism. We have been focusing a lot on one particular cognitive construct, cognitive flexibility, we, which we know to be associated with restricted and repetitive behaviors in autism. And I think just anecdotally probably has a lot to do with why we see these difficulties transitioning to adulthood in kids with autism. So if you look at these grim statistics, about 80% of children with autism spectrum disorder um, have never lived outside, never lived outside of their home, and sort of um, never lived outside of their community, essentially, um, and lived independently. Uh, whereas in these other conditions, you do have higher rates of of independent living. And a similar sort of grim statistic comes about when you look at employment for young adults with autism, who um, about 80% are unemployed or underemployed. And that's a striking number if you compare that to individuals with intellectual disability, language disorder, and learning disability who seem to fare better in the um, employment uh, category. So there's, for me, always a question of, you know, what, what makes it hard for someone to transition to independent living? Obviously, social communication deficits have a lot to do with that transition. But I think also, as we've all noted in our daily routine changes now, Cognitive flexibility has a lot to do with how well you do in a new situation. So going from college to independent living or starting a new job requires flexible cognition and flexible behaviors that um, we know to be disrupted in some individuals with autism. So I think that studying cognitive flexibility will help us get a handle on which individuals will need extra help during these transition phases. And some of that extra help comes from programs that are uh, CBT-based kinds of programs for improving flexibility and enhancing or bolstering executive functions more broadly. Um, and I think eventually we want to understand who will benefit the most from these intensive treatments or therapies and who will stand to, to gain the most from them. So what we do uh, in part in the lab is try to parse heterogeneity at the behavioral level in the executive function domain um, so some of this work, a lot of it was done in collaboration with uh, Stuart Mostofsky's group at Johns Hopkins. And they have some really nice large data sets, including children with autism, children with ADHD, children with comorbid autism and ADHD, and typically developing children. And if you take uh, parent reports of executive function, um, behavioral rating inventory of executive function, for example, you can actually um, create uh, classes or uh, profiles of executive function deficits amongst these um, kids. And one thing we found was that you can actually find evidence for three uh, different categories of children, one in these above executive function uh, 
above average category, another in sort of an average category, and finally a below average or impaired executive function group. And those who are impaired, um, of course, the comorbid ASD and ADHD kids are the most impaired. But surprisingly, if you look in the average executive function group, there are a lot of kids with autism who are fine. Um, there's a lot of ADHD kids who are average as well. So it's not that there is this broad um, and complete executive function deficit in autism, but that it does affect a good chunk of the kids. Uh, Adriana Baez, an undergrad student, did a replication of this for an honors thesis in her um, in her final year, and this was done in collaboration with CARD at UM, and also found this evidence for three groups of individual, three groups of children, I should say. Um, and again, about a third of those kids with autism do fall in the average executive function group. So they're not necessarily impaired, but there are some who are. So when we parse this heterogeneity, it's important to understand how it affects more than just one category of behaviors. And it turns out that those children who fall into these below average executive function classes also exhibit behavioral problems and um, uh, social problems and attention problems and aggression um, and these sort of social and attention and behavioral problems are um, more sort of pronounced in those who also exhibit executive function deficits. So there's consequences for these, um, you know, executive function issues. One thing we've done in the lab is try to parse heterogeneity at the brain level in autism. Um, and one way to do this is just coming up with some simple tasks that can be done in the scanner that uh, tax or uh, ask children to behave in a flexible way. So one of those we've done uh, is well, adapt, uh, adaptation of a flexible item selection task. Um, and we, in, in this version of it, you basically ask the participants to pick two things that go together in one way. So they may pick the, um, these two cards because they both show pictures of rabbits. If you can see, those are supposed to be rabbits. Um, or they may pick these two cards because they're both blue cards. Or they might pick these two cards because the, they both depict one object. So there, things could be matched on shape, color, um, number of items, and size. And in this case, in the scanner, we just do a simple control condition where we have an outline around the boxes the children should press. So they just follow along, press those two, follow along, press this, follow along. So we can do a nice comparison of the brain responses during the flexible item selection to the brain responses dur during a similar control condition. Um, I won't show you the results of this ongoing study now. It'll just keep you hanging. But we did this study first in a, a group of adults, uh, around um, 30 or so adults, to see what the brain responses were to that. That's all in this 2020 Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience paper by Dina Dejani. But when you look at adults, um, there's a great deal of heterogeneity with respect to the brain connectivity underlying responses to this task. So if you use this approach, which is called a group iterative multiple model estimation, it's a study done in collaboration with Katie Gates at UNC. Um, it's an effective connectivity approach that tells you which brain regions are interacting with which other brain regions during task performance. And there's only a few brain regions, the ones in red, which show a group level effect, which means all participants uh, engage this brain region, which is the inferior frontal junction, when doing a flexibility task like the one I showed you. And then there's all kinds of individual level variability in the connectivity of that region with other brain regions while that task is ongoing. So this is an example of this huge heterogeneity in um, brain function that underlies these kinds of complex tasks. So even in typical adults, there's a lot of individual variability in how the brain gets this task done. When you look at those brain regions and you um, apply them to the data set I mentioned before, which includes children with autism, um, children with ADHD, children who are comorbid with autism and ADHD, uh, we basically just did an analysis where we tried to parse those, uh, that big sample um, by the connectivity profile of those brain regions that were you know, activated in this cognitive flexibility task. So all the regions over on the left are just brain regions that showed activation in that flexible item selection task. And then, um, yeah, on the bottom is just that activation again where the regions were obtained. Then we took that huge sample of uh, kids and we had resting state fMRI data from them and tried to say, based on this connectivity profile, are there subgroups of these children, so brain connectivity-based subgroups rather than diagnostic subgroups? 
And the short answer is yes, there are three subgroups, but they're not really stable and they're not really cohesive subgroups. So they're not uh, very strong evidence for um, distinct brain subgroups in this sample. Uh, and on a whole and across the entire sample, executive function deficits are related to connectivity of these nodes, um, some more than others. But um, the short answer here, again, is uh, we cannot do a good job of parsing this heterogeneity just by using the brain connectivity um, related to cognitive flexibility, even though we had high hopes that we would get stable subgroups, we did not find that in this study. So functional connectivity in autism must be considered in the context of this considerable phenotypic heterogeneity. And we, we're still struggling with that, uh, how to address this heterogeneity. Cognitive flexibility is relatively understudied in autism, um, even though it's, it's there and we see it. Um, uh, I think it's partly because there's been so much focus on social communication that cognitive flexibility is sort of a little bit less studied. Um, but there are potential targets for intervention in this domain. And we don't have a clear story about brain connectivity-based subgroups in autism at this moment. So the couple of things, if we have time, I'll get into, I'll probably skip the last 10 slides, but anyway, we're um, very interested in our lab in brain dynamics and how they relate to flexible behaviors. And this is sort of on the, you know, the typical adult side. You can you can break the brain up into lots of regions and look at the pairwise connectivity between all of them. And you can also do this in a dynamic way, which means like across, let's say, 10 minutes, you can take a sliding window and see how different brain regions are talking to each other across a window of 60 seconds, let's say, and then another 60 seconds later, how does that change? Uh, you can use clustering and various other um, kind of approaches to say, well, the brain looks like it's switching between a few different states. Um, and you can characterize these states. You can compute the frequency of occurrence of a particular state. You can look at the dwell time, which is how long does a particular state uh, occur. You can look at transitions between brain states, so how many um, jumps are there between these different configurations. And so Jason in the lab a while ago showed that in typical adults, um, a certain brain network, brain state configurations that are associated with greater cognitive flexibility and greater um, uh, grading work, greater working memory ability. Uh, and here it's those states that are sort of the uh, less highly connected states that are the ones that when individuals spend more time in those states um, and less time in highly connected states, they show better performance on a card sort um, neuropsych battery outside of the scanner. So these are, um, you know, the work we do on the not, not autism and to sort of characterize brain dynamics underlying flexible behaviors more generally. So if you take this extension to autism, you might um, wonder, is, is there evidence for a reduced number of transitions between brain states in autism, for example, as one possible signature of inflexible behaviors? And this actually, when I had this hypothesis, it was several years ago, and I was happy to see that a lot of labs scooped us on this and did find, um, there's at least a handful of papers now that have shown this, uh, and we have yet to publish on it. So as long as somebody's doing it, we're happy. Um, but in the initial studies where we looked at some data from the Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange, we did find evidence for a reduced number of transitions between brain states in, in the autism, in the individuals with autism, um, suggesting that this is going to be a promising approach for understanding brain dynamics going forward. We have another um, wonderful honors thesis student in the lab, Emily Marshall, who just submitted this paper um, on looking at brain dynamics of a particular network that we very much care about um, involving the anterior insular cortex and cingulate, which is a whole other talk. But basically, if you use a, another approach to brain dynamics called co-activation pattern analysis, you essentially ask the question, um, if you look at these areas of the brain highlighted in red and ask the question of, uh, at their sort of most active points, what, is the, what are the other brain regions that also are showing activity at those active points or clustering those um, active points into groups um, gives us what are called co-activation patterns. And it turns out that in the, uh, in the kids with autism, so we find the like, patterns of co-activation between this salience network and the rest of the brain. And there's a couple of these states or co-activation patterns that show up less frequently in kids with autism than typical kids. And it's actually a state two here, which is characterized by co-activation between what we call the central executive or lateral frontal parietal network 
So for some reason, children with autism seem to enter this brain state less frequently than their typically developing peers. And that's something we are trying to understand the significance of uh, as we speak. So dynamic functional connectivity approaches reveal atypical patterns of brain dynamics in autism. We're just getting started with this really. And the extent to which these brain dynamics underlie individual differences in flexible behaviors is an open question we're currently uh, trying to work on. And the final sort of, yeah, it will be final. The final area of research I wanna share with you is really new and really exciting for me because there hasn't been a lot of work done um, in autism in this area. So just conceptually, we see there's sources of variability in the nervous system from the single cell um, level, from ion channels to behavioral responses. And um, there's a nice review about 10 years back that talks about the significance of this noise or variability. And, and the idea is why do we have any noise or variability in a system that is supposed to help us accomplish certain goals? And um, the idea is that if the brain evolved with this sort of, in this sort of noisy um, system, as a noisy system, there must be some um, benefit to that. And if you look at, uh, again, the computational literature, networks formed in the presence of greater noise are more robust to disruption. Um, and some have suggested that this noise might be an expression of the degree of variation in brain signals, um, which are generated by deterministic and random components of brain network processes. Um, and, Finally, it's just to suggest that variability can essentially reflect a greater dynamic range of possible responses to incoming stimuli. So variability might actually help us in ways that um, we, we don't really yet quite understand. And in the uh, functional imaging domain, you can measure the bold signal variability across the brain by just looking at time point to time point changes. And there's lots of ways to do this, but one of them is um, known as a mean squared successive difference measure, where you're just taking the difference between um, subsequent time points and um, squaring and you know, dividing by uh, n minus one. And it's just a way of measuring how much the signal changes from moment to moment. And why is this interesting? Well, it turns out that in the task fMRI literature, there's been uh, a handful of studies that suggest that older adults are slower um, and less consistent in their behavioral response and their brains are characterized by um, decreased signal variability. Whereas younger adults are faster and better at behavioral responses, you know, on a number of cognitive tasks. And that actually um, shows up as an increased variability in their bold signal um, or their brain signal. At the same time, overall variability seems to be um, decreased during conditions requiring inhibition, whereas brain signal variability seems to be increased or better for tasks and processes that require cognitive flexibility. So there's some just really intriguing properties um, that brain variability seems to index. And again, Jason, the hero of our lab, did a study on this a few years ago in collaboration with Aaron Heller at UM, where he looked at brain signal variability across the lifespan in a pretty large sample, uh, including ages 6 to 85 years. And um, there were several brain regions which showed decreased variability over the lifespan. And this is consistent with what I showed you before from Doug Garrett's work. But there was one area, the right dorsal anterior insula, that seemed to show an opposite effect, which is increasing its variability across the lifespan, that is between age six and 85. So there's different patterns of variability changes that are related to aging. And we think some of them may be compensatory and others may just reflect um, aging processes. But when you look at bull signal variability in neurodevelopmental disorders, you know, we started here with a, a small study of ADHD, a preliminary study. And though we didn't find group differences in this study, we did find that for all individuals, what, regardless of diagnosis, they showed an increase in brain signal variability in regions of the dorsal medial and ventromedial prefrontal cortex um, that were uh, in line with um, their, basically their inattentive symptoms in the, in, in the ADHD um, index. So um, sort of extending this to autism in, in a sample from NYU again of, of individuals between seven and 40 years of age, what's striking is that if you look at the developmental trajectory of this old signal variability, there's regions of the brain, um, and generally true for this, this study, that showed a stark, stark decrease in variability across the ages of uh, eight to 40 in autism, whereas that variability didn't show 
as much of a change across age in the typical kids there in red or orange. So something is going on in terms of the age-related variability patterns in autism. And this is uh, something that Jason Nomi has a, a grant from NIH to look at right now is understanding how bold signal variability changes across the lifespan in autism in ways that might uh, be related to uh, behavioral flexibility. So here we think that intrinsic bold signal variability changes across the lifespan may um, impact cognitive flexibility. We think that, or we found that intrinsic bold signal variability in medial prefrontal cortex is related to dimensional, but not categorical differences in ADHD symptomatology. And so far we have preliminary evidence that individuals with ASD exhibit unique developmental trajectories of intrinsic bold signal variability. We'll look for a follow-up from that in the next year or so. This is just a sort of a guess as to what might be going on in terms of this variability in different brain systems across the lifespan and how there may be a sort of optimal balance. Um, as we said, variability is good for flexibility, but it might be bad for tasks requiring inhibition. And there's always going to be an optimal amount of variability. And when one system in the brain sort of re decreases its variability, others might have to take up the challenge. And we think the salience network and insula in particular might be doing that. So it's just a conceptual model. But in the end, um, the assumption that optimal noise or variability is a signature of optimal brain function is one that I think should be taken seriously. So uh, if that's the case, then we must monitor brain noise or variability in a way um, as to maybe be a marker of recovery of function and potentially of clinical outcome. This is from one of Randy McIntosh's papers. So I just wanted to um, finish off and leave time by telling you a little bit about where these kinds of studies go and what the ongoing projects are in the lab um, with respect to network neuroscience of autism. And for a number of years, we've been seeing whether and to what extent we can take some of these brain metrics and use them to classify individuals with autism using machine learning. So discriminate uh, brain scans that were um, collected from children with autism, comparing them to typically developing children and being able to train a classifier to say which ones uh, are the diagnosed and which ones aren't. This is really a uh, work in progress and I wouldn't, um, wouldn't be too hopeful about this at this point. As you can see, there's so much heterogeneity as I've talked about to this point that it'll be a long time before we're getting to brain-based biomarkers, but it doesn't mean we don't try. Um, and in the cognitive neuroscience of autism, we study processes like attention inhibition and social cognition, and we continue to do that with sort of traditional task-based fMRI approaches. And this is a really interesting thing that uh, Celia Romero in our lab just discovered a few months ago, which is that uh, we happen to have a lot of bilinguals here in South Florida, and a lot of our sample that we collect um, ends up being bilingual uh, Spanish-English. And there's always been this um, idea that uh, has come and gone in the literature that being bilingualism may confer benefits for executive function more broadly. And although there's been a lot of recent controversy about whether or not that claim holds, uh, when she looked at our own sample, she did find some evidence that children with autism who are bilingual seem to be doing better in the executive function domain than monolingual children with autism. So there's some very preliminary suggestion here that even though typically developing kids don't seem to show a bilingual um, advantage, that they, they basically don't seem to have this extra boost in executive function from being bilingual. But the kids with uh, autism who are bilingual almost look similar to the typically developing kids. So they, they do seem to get some kind of boost from having this bilingual exposure in the home. So this is something we're really eager to follow up in our current work. So basically, as I mentioned, this sort of lab more generally deals with brain connectivity and cognition because we think that the functions of cortical areas are determined both by their extrinsic connections and intrinsic properties uh, over time, as I mentioned. And we sort of um, gear all our studies, both in the clinical and non-clinical areas towards um, understanding these uh, sort of properties better. So this is the lab that's done all the work I've told you about. Um, and some members are missing here, but this, they're a great group back in the day when we could all get together. Um, and these are the funding sources and the collaborators who have made this work possible over the years, especially thanks to CARD. Um, Michael Alessandri and his team at the University of Miami have made it possible for us to get all kinds of uh, great participation in our studies. And we look forward to being able to do them again once, once we're all allowed to get 
back to our, our usual work. Um, so thank you very much.